Hello everyone, I hope that you're all doing well. For some reason this week I'm feeling extra spooky and I just can't wait to get into the stories. We have an awesome batch this week that I think will really give you the chills. Let us get into it as we drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. I just moved into a new apartment. There's something wrong with the neighbors. Written by Alias For Whom City apartments are rough. My first two places were both basements, because that's what you can afford these days if you're looking to live alone. Third place, no lie, had a window facing a brick wall only three feet away. I was never looking for a spectacular view. I just wanted a decent window. Until last month when I finally got one. I had moved in December 1st to this super small but super decent apartment. Only a few minutes walk from the subway. The main living space of it extended from the kitchen. And a flimsy sliding door separated that from a small bedroom space and the east wall of that bedroom space. A floor-to-ceiling window. I mean, sure, it overlooked the dirty street ahead, a small coffee place, and a huge community housing building. But my god, the air, the sounds, the sunlight. It was perfect, and so shockingly affordable. I'll make a note here that I've never been much of a horror movie person, it's just never caught my interest. So when I couldn't find any bug reports on the building, it really just seemed like a lucky break. Anyway, after settling my debt with my moving helpers, a six pack of beer and a large pizza, they were off on their way and I began putting together my home. I of course started with the Wi-Fi and the living space so I could work to some tunes and then I unboxed some stuff for the kitchen. As I was sliding some plates into the cupboard, a knock came at my door. Crap, maybe the music was too loud. Standing on the other side of the door was a small woman. I smiled apologetically. Oh, sorry, is the music too loud? No, it's fine. The walls here are good, she assured me. I wanted to say hello. I welcome you to the building. Oh. I hadn't expected such a warm reception. I had never been greeted by a neighbor in any of my previous places. Oh, thanks so much. My name's Louis. She shook my hand. Quibla. Love to meet you. She peered in my apartment. This looks great. Do you need curtains? I can give you some. I have extra. Oh, thanks, but I'll get around to it. I'm excited to get some of that December sunlight coming through. I said with a laugh. She didn't laugh. It is no problem. They are lovely curtains. And you need your privacy. She said. I chuckled, feeling some tension in the air. I'll make sure to get some curtains up soon. In the meantime, I'll hide all this. I gestured to my lackluster physique. Under wraps. Again, no reaction from my neighbor. A moment later, she forced out a small laugh and then nodded. If you need anything, I'll be down the hallway. 1710. She nodded once more before turning away and retreating back down the hallway. I waved as I watched her go. Nice lady, odd though. Which brings us to my first night. Dark hit, hard and fast, but there were a couple of yellowed streetlights bathing the street and parking lots outside of the closed coffee shop. And the man that was yelling. It started just as I was laying down on my bed. A senseless hollering. Strings of profanity mixed with accusations at no one. But I'm not new to the city. I was near community housing. 
a place where folks with severe mental illness can very much end up. So, above all else, I need to be patient. Maybe this is why the place cost so little. It would have to be pretty extreme for that much of a price decrease. And this set me on edge. After about an hour of the noise ebbing and flowing, I brought myself up and out of the bed into the window. I looked out over the cold street and watched the snow get caught up in gusts and brought to the man. He walked in jerky circles, flailing his limbs from time to time. I touched the cold glass. At that moment, he spun around and he faced me, as if he could hear that barest touch. He froze. No more noise and no more circles. He just stared back up at me. He couldn't have been staring at me. I was standing in my dark room all alone, 17 stories up. But from everything I could tell, he was standing in that parking lot, leaning at the slightest angle, head cocked right up at me. This wasn't good. I took a step backwards, still watching him. The moment that I moved, he broke into a dead sprint. He was running directly at me. My heart laughed. But I was inside and there were many locked doors between myself and him. It was totally fine. But that didn't stop me from running to my apartment door and triple checking it that it was indeed still locked. And then watching my apartment door from my kitchen table. And then watching the street from my window to see if I could see him again and then the kitchen, and then the window. Man, it wasn't a great night. The next morning, as I opened my door, it had pushed against something. I full-on panicked for a moment, but immediately recognized it as it bundled up window curtains with a note. For the nights, they aren't people. They are cold. Quibla. This was unsettling for sure but also, on a different level, incredibly insulting. Was she talking about the community housing folk? They were sick, not not people. I let my indignant, humanitarian side overpower my anxiousness over all of this, and I tossed the curtain inside and continued on my way. I got a donut and some bad brew at the coffee shop, found out that they only operate from 9 to 5, which really isn't ideal for late night cravings, and I headed off to work. Night two was much quieter. I didn't hear a sound above the passing of night traffic as I laid down to fall asleep. This felt much more comforting, and then it wasn't. It was too quiet. There were other people in this building. There was the community housing just across the street, why was it so quiet? I stood up again and wandered to the window. Nothing out of note there. No folks wandering the street. The only difference from the night before was that one street light had started flickering. Maybe I was just getting in my head over all of this. And then I saw the group on the balcony. Five people stood on a balcony of the community housing building about five stories higher than myself. I couldn't entirely tell if they were speaking to her anything from this far, but one thing was for sure. Each stood facing out, facing me, staring at me. I whispered some curse under my breath and immediately turned to grab that curtain near my front door. I stomped through my house, hoping that the sound of my own movement would be enough to establish some sort of connection to reason. I was imagining things. I was getting worked up over nothing. But if the curtain would help me feel better, easy as that, let's get it up. I got back to my room just in time to see them jump. In unison, each of the five people on the balcony 
easily climbed over the railing and stepped off, still staring directly at me through the window. I dropped the curtain in terror and shouted a meaningless, Stop! I scrambled to my phone and dialed 911 while I made a mad dash out of my apartment and into the elevator. Police and ambulance were on their way. As the elevator rang at the ground floor, I ran out of my building and into the cold. And holy crap, was it cold. The biting night stung at my skin all over, seeing as if I had left wearing only my PJs and slippers. I ran across that quiet road and past the shop to the building, dreading what I was going to see. They stood there. That's all. There were the five figures that I had seen only moments ago, plummeting from over 20 stories, stiffly but casually, looking at me with blank eyes. Nothing seemed to be wrong with them physically. I saw no signs of injury. But behind those eyes, I couldn't tell what I was seeing. I walked closer to the building, scanning the area to see if I was wrong, if it wasn't a different group of people, but only came back to them as sirens began blaring. They walked back inside. My mind was a mess. I felt like I was going crazy as the police talked with me, but I held my composure and assured them my eyes must have been playing tricks on me in the night. The sirens retreated back into the city, I slammed my fist against Quibla's door the next day. It opened only a few inches, revealing a chain lock and her eyes. What the heck is going on? I asked. You didn't put up the curtain, she asked, as if this was some normal irritation. How was the freaking curtain going to stop people from jumping from a building? I demanded. They can see well in the dark. They've noticed you. They won't hurt you, but they'll want to be close. She said as calmly as always. What do those people want? They aren't people, and they want to be warm. I sputtered wordless. How do you respond to that? Put the curtain up. It might not stop it anymore, but it'll give you peace of mind. Was all that she said before closing the door again. And so I did. I put up the curtain and started looking for another apartment. I didn't know what was going on, but I could stay here the two necessary months and head out without messing up my finances too badly. My last night, the curtains were drawn shut and my lights were all off, leaving me in pitch blackness. But there was no way that I was getting to sleep. The past two days were running through my head on an endless loop. What was happening in that building? With those people? They were people, right? A quiet noise caught my attention. Barely a noise, really. Like the sound of a mouse squeaking in the wall. It would be nice to have a normal issue like mice. The same sound, but slightly louder. I curled up on my bed. I didn't want to deal with anything tonight, but I also knew that no sleep was coming if I didn't deal with whatever was causing the sound. I slumped out of my bed and listened closely, tilting my head towards the wall. Silence. Maybe I should just attempt to sleep through it. A singular clicking noise, like hail falling against glass. There was a chance I was just hearing something coming from outside, and that I was fine. Or I was far from fine. They won't hurt you. I shuffled towards the window. They want to be warm. I pulled the curtain aside. Darkness. No streetlight, no snow, nothing. Just the same darkness as my room. I furrowed my brow, absolutely lost. I hit the switch on my lamp, 
bodies stuck to the glass from the outside, awfully contorted and piled bodies, all trying to touch as much of their flesh as possible to the glass at fighting eyes. Their skin folded and flattened in still life before me, with patches of hair and scars and disease. The various faces clouded the window with their heavy breath, tongues and teeth pressed hard almost like a suckerfish, plastered and frozen in ecstasy. No, not suckerfish, more like moths. I screamed and fell back, holding down the bile trying to shoot up. I huddled into a fetal position, rolled away from the sight before me, and I can only describe it as uh, losing my mind. I don't remember much, until dawn came and I saw light piercing through my unmarred window. I left that day. I went to a friend's place and I stayed on their couch. My friends and a couple of cousins I have here in the city had to get my belongings. They all think I just had some sort of random psychological meltdown. It took me this long to get to this point where I'm even considering leaving this house and going back to work. I'm going to live with my friends for a while, and if I do someday get a place again, I am so fine with basements. And before we get into the next story, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Masterworks. Now, let me tell you about an interesting detail about one of the most famous murders in history. It has to do with JFK's assassination. On November 22nd, 1963, the day before his murder, JFK was staying at Hotel Texas in Fort Worth. His last phone call to the outside was about something you wouldn't expect. He spoke about the Van Gogh painting that hung above his bed. Who would have thought one of the last things that JFK ever spoke about was a Van Gogh painting? But I guess the rich and powerful always loved luxurious assets that most people cannot enjoy. Most people think collecting paintings is just a simple hobby. But a closer look reveals that art can be an insanely good investment. Recently, a Warhol sold for $40 million, and a Picasso painting sold for $100 million. Unfortunately, most people don't have $100 million to invest in a Picasso. But a company called Masterworks created the biggest art investing platform on the planet for regular people like us. Now you can get exposure to the appreciation of famous art without having to buy the whole thing. Masterworks has over 298,000 users and has offered almost 100 multi-million dollar works. Want to see which famous artwork is available? Well, you can get priority access by going to masterworks.art slash mrcreep. Again, that's masterworks.art slash mrcreep. Thanks again to Masterworks for sponsoring today's episode. Why I Quit My Job at Stragview Prison Written by Yerushis I quit my job at Stragview Prison today. I've been a correctional officer for about a year now, and I found the job exciting and rewarding. I had been discharged from the military after two years for medical reasons, and as the bills piled up and my funds shrank into the double digits, I knew that I had to find work. The state was paying correction officers good money with excellent benefits, and they generally hired military guys over civilians. I put in an application and I started my new and exciting life as a correctional officer within a month. After a year of yelling at grown men, searching cells, and a mountain of BS, I got myself into a little bit of trouble. I had gotten a bit of a reputation for laying hands on unruly inmates. So when the major had called me into his office, I kind of expected it. I had been assured by my fellow officers that I would get a slap on the wrist, maybe just a few days of administrative leave, and I would be back to work within a week, 
What I hadn't expected was three months on post as I assessed my attitude and the way that I interacted with others. For those who don't know, post is the most boring assignment in all of corrections. You spend your night in a vehicle, driving around the perimeter, trying not to fall asleep and crash your car into a ditch. It's a tedious and unfulfilling work given to older officers, incompetent officers, or officers in need of a good slap on the nose. I was understandably upset about this development, but as there was nothing that I could do about it, I swallowed my pride and prepared for my three month stay in purgatory. Had I known what would happen to me, I would have turned in my badge on the spot. I was met at the gate by Sergeant Mathis on what was to be my first night on post. I had seen Mathis a few times since I had started, but I didn't think that I had ever spoken with him. Mathis is old, old even by DOC standards, and he's been riding post for the last 10 years of his career. To hear some of the older officers tell it, he used to be some tough guy on the compound, but he was sent to post after getting injured and he just never came off of it. He rides post every night, continually roving up and down his two mile track, never missing a night. He looked about as thrilled to see me as I was to be there. Post may not seem as difficult as working on the compound, but you're the prison's first line of defense in many ways. They've put you on Route 2 tonight, the back line, so just be sure you're ready for 12 hours before you head out. He let his hand slide along the bed of the battered old Ford Ranger, like a rider stroking an old but willing steed. So, what do I do on post exactly? I know that I patrol every 15 to 30 minutes, but other than... Patrol constantly, he said rounding on me in sudden anger. He got very close to my face before I realized it, and his eyes were huge and starring. I took a step back from him, and the side mirror slapped into my back, making me jump. His face was wooden, ghoulish in its intensity, and he seemed on the verge of punching me. He seemed to realize what he was doing, and he took a step back. You want to patrol constantly. If you're always moving, then nothing can sneak up on you. Also, make sure you leave your cell phone in the car. I know some of you younger officers think no one will notice if you bring your phone out to post. But trust me when I say that, you don't want any lights out there. No dome lights and no headlights. Just use the light poles to navigate and you'll be okay. I raised an eyebrow at him. Okay from what? He didn't say anything. Just ran a hand along the truck near a big dent in the back fender. Okay from what? I asked again. And he seemed to notice me this time as he came back to reality. I had a conversation with a young officer like you once. Three years ago, he came out to post for a few weeks and didn't think that he had to listen to my warnings either. They found his truck out by the post two shed, doors wide open, come morning after they couldn't raise him on the radio. He wasn't in it, there was no sign of him at all and he didn't show up to work the next day. He didn't show up to work any day after that either, and he was never seen again. I scoffed, dude probably got bored and laughed. Mathis looked at me solidly. Don't get complacent out there, boy. This isn't the sort of place that forgives complacency. There are things out there that are better kept out of prison. What those things were, he refused to elaborate on. He just stumped towards the front and away from me and the idling truck. The first hour and a half were very dull. I watched from the front seat of the ranger as they fed an evening meal, watching the inmates scamper back to their dorms as daylight began to wane and night began to creep up. 
after sundown, the radio announced restricted movement and concluded any unsupervised strolls across the compound. It was 8 o'clock, only two hours into my shaft, and I pulled up next to the post 2 shed and killed the engine. I put my feet up on the dash and I pulled up my phone, not caring about what some old fart had to say, as I surfed Reddit and checked my Facebook. It was a boring post, but I do admit that it did have its perks. As I sat, the sun waning and eventually dying around me, I started to catch something out of the corner of my eye. The compound sat perched on a little incline surrounded by a thick wood. The woods were a good 50 feet away from the fences, but close enough to make them look menacingly close in the dark. Something kept bounding in and out of them, just off to the left of my line of sight. Once or twice, I thought that I caught a glimpse of a dog or something in the side mirror, but I shrugged it off and got back to my phone. By the time that it was getting dark, it was time for me to take my turn around my part of the perimeter. As I cranked the old truck, it sputtered and died on me. I cursed, twisted the key and gave it some gas, this time to make it sputter to life. They always gave corrections the worst vehicles. I was driving around the little dirt path, trying to keep it on the road, when something big ran in front of my truck. I slammed on the brakes, but it was already gone. It had been on the fence side of the road and running for the woods. I had only gotten a quick look at it as it had loped past. It looked like a giant dog and as I looked toward the woods, I couldn't see anything but the nearly invisible tree line. I was still feeling startled as I pulled back towards the sheds. What the heck was that thing? I had heard of some of the area dogs that might have formed a little dog pack, but this thing had been bigger than the usual mutts that I saw in the area. I parked and turned off the truck again pulling out my phone to clear my head. Ten minutes of social media later and I had calmed down a little bit. I had forgotten all about the big dog thing, but decided that I had probably blown it out of proportion. It was just a dog, nothing to worry about. When I looked back at the clock, I realized that it was already ten. I cranked the truck up again and was just about to pull onto the road again when something hit the side of my vehicle. I had reached for my monster in the cup holder just before the hit and I cursed as the drink spilled all over my shirt. I shook the sticky liquid off as I looked behind me, thinking that I had clipped the shed somehow. What I saw was a new dent in the back of my truck and no sight of whatever I had hit. If the dent hadn't been there, I would have thought that I had imagined the whole thing. I got out and looked around, but there was nothing to see. Just a dent in the fender and the oppressive darkness around the shed. After doing my circuit again, I pulled back up to the shed in a pretty foul mood. I felt sticky and miserable. I was covered in the energy drink, and my butt was starting to fall asleep and I needed to go to the bathroom like a racehorse. I looked around for a bathroom, but there was no one to be seen. I wondered where the other post drivers went to the bathroom. They probably carried a bottle or something. I looked around fretfully and finally decided to just go behind the shed. It was hidden pretty well, and I doubted that anyone would see me. I stepped out of the car leaving the door open and the engine running, and I walked behind the shed to do my business. I had barely started when I heard something slam into the side of the truck. A stream of hot you-know-what joined the energy drink in my shirt as I jumped about a mile. I turned to see what had hit the car, just as a second loud crunch shattered the passenger window. I got myself zipped up and rounded the shed, Expecting a large dog or a bird maybe, 
but I found much worse. Between me and the door, its massive shoulder resting against the dent, was something that was part mountain lion and part nightmare hound. Its skin was a midnight black, chitinous plates that creaked when it moved, with a long snout full of sharp teeth that dribbled over its jaws. Its eyes were non-existent, and its feet were home to long, sharp claws that had sliced a line in the side of my ranger. It turned that eyeless head on me and opened its mouth to lose a loud, angry sound that immediately sent me running. My boots clapped against the dirt road as I ran for my life. As I ran, my mind raced, trying to form a plan that didn't involve trying to outsprint this thing for half a mile. I could double back to the car. I wasn't that far away, and there was a radio and a shotgun in there that I could use to call for help and to defend myself. No matter how big this thing was, a load of buckshot to the face was likely to leave it in a bad way. Yeah, it probably hadn't even left the shed yet. I was sure that I could turn now and make it back before it. I heard it snarl right behind me then, and I didn't have to look to know that it was less than a foot away. I sprinted, running flat out and if I had fallen I would have died. I hadn't run far when my back exploded in agony. I wanted to stop, wanted to see how bad it had clawed me, but I knew that I had to run. I ran the spotlights offering me islands of light in the growing darkness. And as I ran, I heard its heavy footfalls behind me veer out of the light. It didn't seem to like being in the light, and I used that to my advantage, putting on a burst of speed every time I left one of the islands of safety. I could see the curve that it would take me around the fence and back into the prison's front area. There would be people there, Guards in the control room, doors to hide behind, and people that would shoot this thing and let me live another day. But that's when I trapped. I fell hard in the dirt, rolling as I fell, and I covered my head with my arms as I came to a stop. I just knew that it would be on me now, tearing me apart, and I quivered as the seconds ticked on with no ripping pain. Something fell across me then. Some bright flash that blinded me, even behind my closed eyelids. I sat as still as I could in the sand as some new roaring monster stopped inches from my head. The monster quieted it all at once, and I heard someone ask what the heck I thought I was doing. I opened my eyes and found the post one vehicle sitting before me, the lights bathing me where I sat. I didn't answer her, I just got up and ran. I ran to my truck, pushed the keys into the ignition, and thundered out of the parking lot like a bat out of hack. My phone rang about 10 minutes later, but I didn't answer it, and it's been ringing all night, but I still haven't answered it. I know that it's the prison, but I don't care. I'm never going back there again. I'm sitting in the bathtub, my back wound making the water red as I soak up all the heat. The cuts on my back are deep, but I don't know where to get them cleaned and tended to. I don't even know if I ever want to leave the house again. What I saw tonight, I stumbled across something I can't explain. I'm not going back to work, but if you take my place, be sure to listen to the old man when he tells you to continually rove. If you have to go to post, make sure that you follow the rules. Don't stop. Don't bring anything out there that might draw its attention. And don't get out of the car for any reason. Otherwise, they might find your car out on post one in the morning. After whatever lives in the woods finds you. We were told never to leave the forest. I should have listened. Written by David Morningway Only chaos and danger await outside the forest. 
Nightmare creatures and other beings of sinister design and nature dwell among life forms and dark landscapes as alien to us as we are to them. Over and over, the elders' warnings kept repeating within Faustus' young mind. Every child and adolescent knew the warnings, and were usually told weekly, if not daily, of the ominous and frenetically savage world outside of the forest. However, out of all the mysteriously terrifying tales and ancient legends, there is not one actual first-hand account or factual shred of proof. They remained just that. Tales and legends. All that anyone could ever say for certain was hearing strange alien noises or an occasional flash of unfamiliar light. In fact, no one had ever made it far enough past the forest edge to ever find out. Faustus was slightly small for his young age, never being quite as big or strong as the other boys. Luckily, he was able to balance it out by being the fastest and being capable to last the longest in any cardio-based endeavor. But still, he longed to be accepted by the other lads as their equal, as a man, even though he was barely a teenager himself. And this foolish drive had led Faustus halfway to the edge of the forest, in the middle of the night. The closer that he approached, the quicker his boyish pride seemed to want to trade in on this bad investment for popularity, man cut even, swiftly retreating home. He hadn't told anyone of his late night adventure anyhow. Plus, if his parents found out that he wasn't actually sleeping at home, they would ground him until next spring. No, he had nothing to lose by going home now. Faustus closed his eyes and inhaled deeply, before opening his eyes and exhaling slowly. I can do this, he thought. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. There is nothing to fear past the forest edge. It's just more forest and fields. That's all he said, convincing himself that elders told these stories to keep children from wandering off and getting lost or picked off by predators. No more than 15 minutes had gone by before he suddenly stopped his steady pace. Before him, not 30 paces away stood the forest edge, towering like an unknown gargantuan entity composed of pure shadow. As he approached, though, he found himself feeling silly for being so scared, for there was no grand alien landscape, no ghouls or unknown entities. It was just a field, with more trees on at the other end, nothing more. Faustus figured he could cross the clearing, walk around for a bit and then head home and challenge the older boys to cross tomorrow, knowing that they would be too frightened to thus securing his manhood and his station within the community. He could even make it home soon enough to get a decent night's sleep still. I'm doing this, Faustus accidentally exclaimed out loud, before crouching low on the defense next to a large pine tree to see if any imaginary monsters or real predators had hurt him. He quickly straightened up, confidence once again taking over and walked with purpose across the grass clearing ahead. The woods across the clearing at first seemed as typical as any other part of the forest, with grass, trees, leaves, all appearing normal. However, that thought quickly began to vanish into confusion and panic, making his heart pace slowly start to rise into warm, chaotic rhythms, like water slowly reaching a boil. As great, monolithic structures became visible, along with the ending of the forest, and the world as he knew it. It took every ounce of willpower and courage to control the fight-or-flight responses screaming into Faustus' mind and his nervous system, making his heart pound hard and erratic within him, like thunder trying to break free of the clouds. He took a few controlled, deep breaths, pushing the storm of his fearful emotions back down, somewhat steadying himself, and he moved forward. With every step that he took, the world became less familiar and increasingly more horrifying. He could see in more frightening detail these strange, symmetric triangular monoliths, which became more imminent with every passing second and forced a step forward. The foreign structures seemed to dot the strange new landscape before him, 
stretching up so high and into the night sky. They seemed to be reaching for these stars themselves. With his final steps out of the tree line, he stopped, frozen in the realization that almost everything he could not perceive with his senses was both wholly unfamiliar and extremely unnerving. It seemed that at one time, perhaps, this new and strange world might not have been very different inherently from his own, although minimally, for he could identify certain plants and trees that existed in his world as well. Although, unlike the forest, this foliage seemed scattered, or with no logical purpose, at least one Faustus could not presently fathom. Unfortunately, Faustus would not be able to process this long enough to establish an answer or a logical theory. In fact, he would not even have time to process another coherent thought for the rest of his odyssey into this forbidden and increasingly disturbing place. For a shift had now occurred. A creeping dread that threatened to close his windpipe and crush his chest as if the air pressure itself had increased and was screaming at his instincts that something was so very wrong. After a few unbearably long and silent moments, Faustus resumed his careful pace, but was stopped short by a silent and still river of the most peculiar nature. At least his mind first told him that it was inherently aquatic, for its size and shape matched that of a large and prominent river, with a flattened symmetry of a grayish coloration. Oddly enough, when he approached this new site, he noticed that it was just as still and silent as the rest of the atmosphere around him had become. It appeared perfectly smoothed out, as water does rock in a perpetual flowing current, but also somehow rough and gritty to the immediate touch. The feeling of unparalleled dread Faustus had felt upon arriving in this mysterious place had not yet faded. He had hoped that it was just the shock of seeing a whole new and frightening world, and that the feeling would soon transition into awe and wonder. However, this shift in his surroundings this sudden and nerve-crushing fear had to be instincts, for living his entire life in the forest had strengthened these instincts into a finely tuned instrument for detecting danger, strung into his very nervous system, and knowing when these chords were being stroked that it had become second nature to him, and had never sung to him falsely. As he crossed the oddly still river, this instinctual song of warning hit its crescendo upon putting his feet back on the grass, and his eyes now on two golden orbs hovering below the tall thorn bushes at the base of the closest monolithic structure. At first, Faustus thought logically, his brain snap firing at light speed, trying to formulate any rationalization as to what visibly loomed before him. Lightning bugs, they're just doing their very normal, very common mating dance, thought Faustus logically. Yeah, that's it, he thought, calming himself down a bit. It's not uncommon at the end of mating season to see loose stragglers such as these hover near each other instead of the mass group of chaotic light constructed by these angelic looking insects at the season's peak. As this more reasonable thought took root in his mind, he inhaled slowly and deeply, and went to exhale in the same manner. But the air caught in his throat sharply, almost gagging himself, as the two yellow orbs blinked. Not gently faded out independently as lightning bugs do, but simultaneously and instantly blinked out of existence only to return twice as fast and with twice their intensity, like two vast stars being snuffed out, only to swiftly return with the violent and beautiful rebirth of a phoenix. Moonlight shimmered across the yellow orbs as hot panic thrust itself through Faustus's brain, sending intense bursts of adrenaline and near-crippling fear shooting down his spine until it hit his stomach making a brief gurgle of the acids within, upon the unforgiving, stark realization that these two orbs were not sentient, 
the part of a sentience. Unfortunately, he had less than a second to process this before the eyes and their master quickly took a few short and quick paces forward, before abruptly stopping, both compacting itself to the ground while keeping its head raised high, preparing its body for an obvious leap attack. Its body, oh god, its body, thought Faustus, freezing up at the sight. It was beyond black, seeming to be composed of pure shadow, drawing an all-surrounding ambient light like a black hole, making the immediate threat seem almost rather ethereal than physical. Nevertheless, the gravity of how very real this threat was came crushing down on him like an avalanche of horrifying truth. As enormous white teeth began emerging from the Vanta Black, ivory fanged daggers of the most imposing predatorial beast revealed themselves to him, contrasting hard within the dark void of the creature. Faustus needed no more encouragement and with a quick twist and powerful thrust, he was running in the opposite direction, and the chase was on. He had barely made it a dozen paces, circling around a small tree when he felt an electric hot shock slice through his backside. Though initially painful, it seemed to be just a graze, for he lost no motor skills and even bought himself a full second while the creature's claws were temporarily stuck into the tree. Whether the adrenaline is masking the severity of the injury, thought Faustus, or I barely just evaded a critical wound, either instance was deemed irrelevant, for in this moment all that mattered was to survive, to run, and taking advantage of the brief window of luck while the shadow demon's claws were caught in the tree, Faustus veered upwards and to the left with a motivated haste, sprinting through a large patch of thorn-covered ivy, subsequently cutting himself with dozens of small lacerations in the process, but denying the beast a direct path to him, for the shadow creature was clearly too large to fit inside, let alone navigate through the thorns and ivy. As he watched the monster carefully slither back out, he breathed out a sigh of relief at his temporary reprieve from death, just to have his panic return with a vengeance, for as the shadow demon deemed the course impassable, it quickly began traversing around the thicket, where it was hollow and exposed at the other end where Faustus now stood. Five seconds perhaps, I thought Faustus, until he would be found. So without hesitation to have her a second to spare, he began the count. Five seconds, he internally said, as Faustus erupted out of the foliage and onto the base of the closest monolith. Now facing the alien structure, he could make out through the moonlight that the strange structure was actually a dull red in most places, with the bottom part of the side closest to him seeming to be made out of some kind of white rock material from the best of his understanding. Four seconds. He reminded himself his panic began to bloom like a black lily within his heart, making it beat hard and almost painful. He began to blindly run before the shadow beast could pin and corner him against the wall of the monolith, but stopped suddenly as he noticed a slight horizontal opening at the very bottom of the structure, almost like a crack in the structure, but perfectly symmetric. Three seconds, he thought. Peering inside the dark aperture, as he heard the stealthy and tenacious footfalls of death steadily approaching behind him, along with the sound of frantic, excited breathing, no doubt anticipating the meal and the thrill of the kill. Two seconds. As young Faustus moved his legs as fast as the blood could pump into them, throwing himself into an unknown abyss of eldritch origin and probable maleficent intent. One second. He yells out audibly this time, as the wall that he squeezed through minorly shook from the impact, as one dark, clawed appendage grasped feverishly for him, but to no avail. Thought Faustus, feeling a bit of hope return, he could not fit. Faustus now wondered if the strange cave-like entrance was in fact composed of rock as he initially thought, for it shuddered ever so slightly each time the shadow beast attempted grabbing him. Or, I thought Faustus in terror, is the monster truly that strong? Strong enough to make rock shake? 
Thankfully, after just a few moments, the beast had seemingly given up, retracting its arm and vanishing back into the night. Faustus was now trapped within an alien structure, and the land his elders called a nightmare or even hell. With his only known portal of escape and guarded by his relentless pursuer, Obviously, there were only two options. Try running home and probably be eaten, if not worse, or head further down the rabbit hole. He glanced around nervously, before his eyes met the faintest bit of light. On the opposing side of the dark room, he saw flat lines of dim light, which presented themselves in the shape of the uppercase letter L. An almost perfect right angle with the vertical line of illumination, appearing longer than the bottom portion. As he cautiously inched his way toward the light, he began hearing an amalgamation of unorthodox noises, which accosted his ears, in the same manner that all the disturbing sights he beheld had accosted his eyes. Approaching the threshold, Faustus noticed that the smaller horizontal crevice at the bottom was just big enough for him to squeeze through. As he anxiously pressed his body through the illuminated slit of light, these strange and unfamiliar sounds escalated in volume along with his panic. He soon crossed over into a long corridor, which seemed to have its own sun, that floated high above Faustus, and glowed in a natural color that made the atmosphere seem cold and empty. The ground in which he now stood on felt both hard and smooth to the touch, much like river stones, only with slightly raised, symmetric square indentations, which were about five times longer than Faustus's entire body. After traversing another short distance, he spotted an opening to his left that appeared to be the source of the odd noises. The chamber was dark, with bizarre, erratic lights issuing from somewhere within. Since Faustus could not identify the light's origin, he deemed it unwise to enter into instead just simply keep moving one foot in front of the other, as he had done since his first step into this otherworldly journey into the unknown. Every chamber and corridor that he trekked through became increasingly disturbing and frightening to his senses, until he eventually found himself standing inside a considerably large room, with the multiple suns adored atop its high sky, and structures that he had never seen in the forest before, Sights that until this very day remained only notional, not even existing in the most insane of dreams. Nevertheless, his mind began forming to some of the objects found within the colossal room. For in his humble forest community, families would fashion rudimentary platforms for eating food, and smaller seats of straw or wood to sometimes sit more comfortably as one ate. Although the objects were vaguely similar, they were crafted with more elaborate expertise than he thought was even possible, with one more alarming detail that overshadowed everything else in horrific truth. They were absolutely massive. Nothing short of a giant would adorn itself into those structures, with other peculiar attachments to them that made Faustus wonder about their physiology compared to his own. Neheta Ojimdur, a voice louder than thunder, echoed through the great halls of the ancient esoteric structure, as if a sentient storm had called out to Faustus in a foreign tongue. Ua, de ra hojimda. The beastly baritone voice cried out again, before a loud, reverberating crash rang out, sounding as if two trees were smashed together hard, but with purpose, with a curious metallic clicking that was briefly audible right after the crash of wood. Faustus's nerves threatened to freeze him in place, as he reluctantly forced himself to peek around at the corner into the next corridor, stealing himself to deal with whatever awaited from beyond. Faustus assumed that after experiencing so many horrifying and unearthly sights, that whatever lay beyond this precipice of madness, he would be somewhat ready for her. He was wrong. Albeit, Faustus was logically expecting something extremely large, according to the overwhelming volume of its words, which Faustus quite literally felt rumble his chest every time the venomous form voice cried out. Every ounce of courage and willpower had left the young boy, 
freezing in place as he glanced around the corner. The behemoth's size was the first attribute he visually took in of the titanic being, easily being over three to four thousand times larger than Faustus himself, with his own sun adored upon his unnaturally large head. The sun aloft the titan's head, however, shined meagerly, if at all, in comparison to the bright yet algrid solar lights that graced the upper chambers, and which Faustus was an unwilling yet amazed witness of. Furthermore, Faustus beheld two immensely vast eyes that held irises glowing so blue they like appeared as water flowing around his pupil. A second kind of fur skin engulfed most of its gargantuan body, save for its face and the end of some extremities, which ran bare all the way down to its long, odd-looking claws, with that part of the colossal beast being a divergent and ghastly shade of white. Faustus followed the creature's physiology all the way to its feet, where he gasped in a panic-induced fear as he began to faintly tremble at the sinister sight before him. The demon, thought Faustus trepidatiously, as the same shadow creature that frenetically chased him into the monolith within this hellscape, weaved between the titan's legs like a graceful serpent, before sitting next to him patiently, as if awaiting orders. As the titan stood directly under the nearest sun, it seemed to light up his own solar energy upon his head, making it shine like a glowing crown or a halo, thought Faustus as his disquiet took on a whole new revelation. It was an angel, he thought, and the demon in all veracity was no demon at all, but simply a harbinger for its master, for the angel of death. The shadow beast shifted itself into a still position, smelling the air, until it promptly jerked its head directly at Faustus, apparently catching the young boy's scent within the still air of the chamber. No, thought Faustus, I want to live. He proclaimed to himself mentally and prepared once again for the chase. The dark monster began systematically checking the immediate area, meaning that he did not actually see Faustus. Regardless, he knew it was only a small amount of time before he would be sniffed out, and he knew that sprinting for the small threshold which ushered him into this place would be his only viable option for survival, and his only way out. He peeked his head out to spy on the shadow monster's advancement, marveling in horror at how the beast was so dark that it merely needed to be close to a shadow in order to disappear completely and if not for his blazing yellow eyes, Faustus surely would have been eaten upon their first meeting. Perhaps, Faustus pondered, that it poisoned you with its fangs, and it would bring you to the master. He wasn't certain of the titan being an angel or the shadow serpent being a demon. In fact, there was only one fact Faustus knew verily, and that was that he had no clue what was actually going on. Now he said to himself internally, as Faustus began running with all his might and well, back the way that he came, back down the rabbit hole, to reverse this dreadful odyssey. The shadow demon was proving too fast though, tenaciously pursuing him until it almost reached within striking distance, forcing Faustus to abandon his desperate retreat and make a frantic detour, running under one of two large metal cube-like structures that were constructed within this specific disturbing realm. Faustus dove under the closest cube-like structure, barely fitting in even more narrowly evading a pair of dark claws, as the shadow monster attempted to slithering under after the young one, with only his reach being able to fit. Pinned against the far wall under the cube, Faustus watched the obsidian appendages try their hardest to hook him, each time the giant claws coming inches away from poor Faustus' face as he flattened himself as much as possible against the far wall. Faustus closed his eyes crying, waiting for a horrific fate that seemed more probable each second by a creature that should not even exist in a world that he did not even belong. Faustus both heard and felt the cacophonous steps of the forthcoming titan, and as these sounds hit their pinnacle, the shadow demon withdrew itself and for one brief moment, 
The tumultuous world around Faustus was a quiet and still, like the calm before a nasty storm. Everything happened all at once. Instantaneously, Faustus's inefficient sanctuary was ripped away, leaving him exposed and ultimately vulnerable. He made a desperate yet hopeless attempt to once again flee and abscond his fate, just to find himself imprisoned inside the titan's hand. Catching Faustus early on, his brave yet futile escape. Faustus waited apprehensively for the crushing pressure of the titan closing his massive hand. However, the colossal being swiftly began moving at an impossible speed, with Faustus still in the prison of his iron grip. As the world between the titan's fingers moved at light speed, Faustus saw blurry glimpses of otherworldly sights and sounds and had to realistically wonder if the end of this trip was directly into the shadow demon's mouth. The world slowed down for Faustus as the titan stopped moving, all the lights visible before now gone, replaced by only darkness, by the near absence of a sight almost completely. As Faustus waited to be fed to the shadow beast, the only sounds that could be heard were, wait, thought Faustus in recognition, it was these sounds of the forest. The same time that he realized this was the same time he felt a rush of air and a mild thud as he impacted the ground. The titan had relinquished him and not only spared his life but brought him back to the forest's edge and away from the demon. Crying tears of unfathomable joy, Faustus wasted no time in running home where he told his village of his wayward adventure and confirmed everything that they had ever feared and more about the world outside of their own. Faustus's bravery was never put into question again, not for all of his long and happy days. Ojimder, Ojimder, a voice yelled out into the night. Ojimer, the voice says, gaining a higher pitch. Ojimer, Ojimer, the voice says, sounding even higher now. Oliver yells a young man into the night, with hair as blonde and bright as the sun, and irises in such a blue manner, that it appeared as if the sky and the ocean once fought over the dominance of each other's color, with neither one truly being the victor. The young man presided within his front doorway, after closing the small gap in the white garage door he usually leaves open, and proceeded to call out his name into the night, almost sounding worried a bit. A black shadow swiftly darted within, making the man shut the door quickly so the black cat couldn't get back out, which made the door slam and a loud sound reverberate throughout his house. Smiling down at the black cat traversing between his legs, he directed his gaze into the feline's deep yellow eyes as the cat sat looking up at him, and he spoke as he bent down to lovingly pat the cat's head. Hmm, he said contemplating as he scratched under the black cat's chin. It's funny, he began. To me, you're absolutely the most adorable cute thing in the world. But I couldn't even begin to imagine that poor little mouse's perception. When I was a child in Greece, people kept disappearing from my village. Written by Visual Sun 9225. It was a village of 300 souls in which I was born. In 1974, shortly after the fall of Greek Junta, in a two story stone farmhouse in the mountainous interior of the Peloponnese, far away from the Azure Sea and far from a civilization. A shrinking village of substance farmers and herdsmen, where the air was cool and clean and crisp in the summer, and where a light coat of snow blanketed the gentle slopes in the winter. The farmhouse sat high on a mountain that sloped down to a small lake, where wild blackberries, raspberries, and dewberries grew along its shore. My family, my father, mother, maternal grandmother, and two older brothers, had a herd of about 30 black goats. They also tended to a flock of speckled chickens that laid eggs the color of a summer sky. 
and although the soil was thin and rocky, we managed to keep a small orchard of apple trees. I have never seen any other apples like these, purple as a plum, with red specks shaped like teardrops. The crispest, sweetest apples that I've ever tasted. Oh, how I wish I could have another bite. We weren't rich by any means, but we made do. The eggs and goat milk were sold in the village market year-round. In late autumn, when the apples ripened, my mother would bake tarts and cakes to sell. An idyllic childhood. Except my father had a secret. It was not a horrible secret, although some people would say that it was. He wasn't a killer or a body snatcher, but he was a pagan. He still worshipped Zeus. Now historians will tell you that the ancient Greek religion died out over a thousand years ago, and that modern practitioners are recent adopters. My father disputed this. He said that while the people of his region had adopted Christianity, a few had always practiced the old ways in secret, passing the ancient knowledge down generation to generation. While we went to the Orthodox Church in the village presided over by the ancient father Hierotheus, we also prayed to the twelve Olympians. In the cover of the night, our family would walk down to the lake. Under the shade of a massive oak tree stood part of a broken Doric column, about a meter in height, which my father claimed was the only remnant of an ancient temple dedicated to the goddess of Dispona. He would lead us in prayer, singing hymns to the gods of the ancient pantheon, before pouring offerings over the column's jagged top. Sweet wine, olive oil, fur honey, and fresh goat's milk. We always worshipped alone, but we were not the only people to pray by the lake. I often saw offerings of fruit and bread that were not left by us. Occasionally, we arrived to blood dripping down the fluted column. My father swore me to secrecy, ordering me never to tell any kids at school what we did, for this was a religious village, where the feast days were observed and icons adorned the houses. However, it seemed that most in the community were aware that paganism still survived in parts of the Peloponnese. But the father often warned in his sermons about the danger of worshipping the ancient gods, who he claimed were demons, fallen angels, servants of Satan, whose worship would lead to an eternity in hell. At the age of ten, my father took me out onto the lake in a canoe at dusk, a clay vessel filled with sweet wine in tow. A few hundred meters from shore, he told me to look down in the clear cerulean waters. On the dirt bed lay a white marble statue of a woman. He identified her as a Dispona and poured out the wine while chanting a prayer. Now, although I participated in the rituals, although I learned the ancient Greek prayers and hymns, I did not really believe them. While I enjoyed the stories that I was told, especially the ones about monsters, the sirens who lured sailors to the death, the harpies who carried men away to the Aranese, the beautiful Lamy who seduced young men before devouring them, the Gorgon sisters with snakes for hair, whose horrifying visages could turn a man into stone. I viewed them as real as the children's novel by Theolina. Unlike in the old stories, I never saw a water nymph dancing lightly across the lake. I never saw fawns frolicking among the fir trees, nor a centaur sparring. I didn't really believe in anything. No god ever spoke to me, neither the god of Israel nor the gods of the Pantheon. When I was twelve, a hard year where a pox killed half of her goats, I suggested to my father that we retrieve the statue from the lake and try to sell it. His countenance appeared enraged at first, and I thought that he was going to strike me. But instead, he started crying, telling me that the old religion was dying, that so many people, mostly young people, had left over the past century, going to Petras or Athens, or to America, leaving entire ghost towns behind. Yes, most of these people were not pagans, but some were, or the sons and daughters of pagans. 
He told me how he wanted to continue the tradition. How in a village where most of the people were over 60, it was crucial for young people to learn the truth before the knowledge was lost forever. I promised that I would continue to learn and practice it. But even as a 12-year-old, I knew that this village would not be my home forever. The summer before my final year of school, Constantinos, a classmate of mine whom I played football with in the field behind the two-room schoolhouse, had vanished. There were lots of talks, but for nothing exciting happened in our village, but not much concern. It was thought that he had grown tired of the rural life and ran off to Athens. He wouldn't have been the first. However, a month later, three other teenagers vanished within a week. Maybe they had followed him to Athens, or maybe something sinister was at play. A search party was organized. The scent dogs from the police were brought in, but nothing was found. Precautions were put in place. The village youth were told to always walk in groups and to, to never be out before dawn or past dusk. One weekend, when a Romani tinker arrived at the marketplace, he was set upon by a group of men. He feared that he would be beaten, but father intervened, saving his life but banishing him from the village. The Sunday after the fourth disappearance, father gave all the children and young adults in the village small oaken crosses that he had blessed, instructing us to keep them on at all times, teaching us a prayer if we ever came across a demon, ordering us to rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. For no demons, he taught, can withstand the power of our Lord. My father also gave me an amulet of sorts, a small concave disc of bronze that could fit in my palm. On it, in five concentric circles, were inscribed dozens of symbols. Some of them looked like objects that I recognized, a horse, a stag, a chalice, an arrow, where others were undecipherable, curved in straight lines combined to form abstractions. I asked him about it, and he said that the characters used predated the Greek alphabet by many centuries. He, like father, told me to keep it with me, telling me that there was ancient magic in it. I did, but I also kept something else in my other pocket, a hunting knife. If there was a nonce in our village, I thought that would be more effective than any religious artifacts. Two days later, on a clear summer day, just before sunset, I saw a white doe behind the farmhouse, pure white and more beautiful than any creature I'd ever seen. It ran down towards the lake, more graceful than any ballerina. Enchanted, I chased after it. There was no doe by the lake, but there was a girl of about 20 topless, wearing only a long flowy black skirt that covered her legs and feet. She had black hair that fell past her waist and blue gray eyes. Her pale skin seemed to glow like the moon in the light. Come to me, Georgios, she sang sweetly. Although I was a teenage boy, I usually would not follow a mysterious girl, no matter how beautiful she was, especially with all the disappearances. Especially a girl who I had never seen before yet knew my name. But there was something enchanting about her that cast a spell on me. She moved lightly, seemed to almost float above the ground, to a gnarled old oak tree. There, she jumped into a small hole at its base and vanished. I walked over and looked down. The hole was small, maybe leading a rabbit's warren, and it was pure black. I had no idea how she fit down it, but I put my foot in and I was instantly sucked down. I landed softly on a dirt floor. Only a trickle of light came in from the small opening, about three meters above me. Before me stood the girl, her skin glowing like a full moon. Every one of her features visible. She put out her arms and I ran over embracing her, her skin icy cold. We tumbled to the ground, she on top of me. She kissed me, first on the lips before working her way down along my neck her freezing hands caressing my back. With one swift motion, she ripped off my shirt and continued down my chest and abs, her lips freezing the skin that they touched. 
As she was unbuttoning my pants, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Maybe I was getting used to the dark, or maybe a final ray of the setting sun briefly illuminated something. I turned my head and saw less than a meter away what looked like a head. Suddenly, the room was awash with light. It was the head of Constantinos, my friend, his bright blue eyes still open. He was decaying, chunks of his flesh missing as if vultures had been pecking at it. I screamed. She arose and pulled down her skirt. Where her legs should have been was a serpentine tail. She tickled me with its tip and smiled, revealing two long, curved fangs. I knew what this creature was. I remembered from my dad's stories. She was a Lamia, an enchantress who seduced a young man before devouring them. She continued laughing. I looked into her monstrous maw, which had grown to the size of my head, her fangs dripping with what could only be venom. I scrambled up and backed away from her. I looked around for an escape route. I was in a circular chamber about 10 meters in diameter, whose walls and ceiling were formed by the ancient oak's roots. Several other bodies and uh, severed limbs scattered about the floor. Among the oak's roots were dozens of skulls, a few with uh, strips of flesh still attached but most bare. She continued laughing, making no effort to advance towards me. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my knife. She showed no fear. I charged and slashed at the monster. She jumped back, the knife just grazing her left breast, resulting in a single drop of blood falling to the ground. I slashed again, but she, with an impossible speed, grabbed my wrist and stripped me of my knife and threw it upwards, where it embedded itself in the eye socket of a skull. It's a shame you saw your friend's head, she said. We were going to have some more fun. I backed away from her. She slowly walked towards me. Walked isn't the correct word, more like floated. The tip of her tail just dragging on the ground. I was going to die. I looked around again for an escape route, but there was none. I was going to be eaten, my body left to rot. But suddenly, I remembered what I had been given. When she was within an arm's length from me, I reached into my left pocket and pulled out the cross and the ancient disc, raising them while reciting the prayer that father had taught me. Almost at once, she screamed, an animalistic wail. Her body turned to a cloud of dust, floating above the ground for a few seconds before softly falling. The disc that I held cracked into two. I started climbing the roots of the tree, doing my best to avoid the skulls, heading towards the entrance hall. When I was nearly out, I heard the crack of lightning. The roots caught fire almost at once and the smoke filled the chamber. I kept climbing, coughing and choking, trying to ignore the pain my hands felt from the fiery branches. I somehow managed to pull myself out. Once free, I dove into the lake, never feeling more relief in my life. I stood immersed in the lake, watching the giant oak tree over 40 meters tall become engulfed in blue flames. It didn't take long, at most 15 minutes to turn the giant of the forest into a pile of ash. Amazingly, the flames didn't spread. I ran back to my house and told my father what had happened, showing him the broken disc. Miraculously, I was unscathed and my hands were free of burns. It is finished, he said, taking back the disc. I left my village for Athens a few years later and then moved to London in 1997. I last returned to Greece last November for my father's funeral. The village's population had decreased to under 100, and my mom had died a few years earlier. One of my brothers had moved to Athens and the oldest brother, the only member of our family left in the village. The village our family called home for countless generations. He still lived in the old farmhouse, but a blight wiped out the apple orchard and the goats were numbered to five. After the singing of Memory Eternal marked the end of the service, led by good old father, 
who white-bearded when I was a child, had to be over a hundred now. My brothers and I went to the column by the lake. We gave offerings of wine and honey and sweetbreads, while reciting the elegies and prayers for the dead. On the way back I noticed where the giant oak once stood, an apple tree grew in its place. I picked a purple apple marked with red tears and headed back to the farmhouse. Once inside, my oldest brother handed me a white envelope with my name on it and my father's script. I opened it. Along with the two pieces of broken disc was a short note. Please remember, this is what saved you. Your loving vampires. As I held the disc together, I felt a surge of electricity course through my body. Both the cross from father and the broken disc lie on my bedside table in my London flat. Which one had worked? I had always assumed that it was the cross. The breaking of the disc showing the triumph of Christianity over paganism. It made me a believer. Every Sunday, I attend St. Sophia's Cathedral, the Byzantine church with its ornate mosaics a far cry from the simple wooden church of my youth. But was I mistaken? Was the disc my savior? Or were they both needed to defeat the Lamia, the old and new traditions combining in a synergistic fashion? My father's message and the apple tree sowed seeds of doubt in me. I've arranged a meeting next week with a Mycenaean Greek scholar at the British Museum. Hopefully she can translate the disc. She won't have all the answers, but I hope that it'll start the journey of uncovering the truth. I found a set of tapes in my new house. They're of a disturbing confession. Written by Demon Lord Mammon. Getting onto the housing market as a new homeowner was horrible. It is perhaps one of the worst experiences you can possibly have, especially when you're getting your first mortgage and then finding out just how much it's going to set you back. That, of course, says nothing to the insane amount of time you're paying that thing off for. Worse if you're seemingly allergic to long-term employment like I am. Still, I feel like I've locked out here. Living in my parents' old house has become uh, untenable, in no small part due to the normal societal convention of, if you're older than 18, you should have your butt out that door, that many of us love so much. So I was set with having a house hunt as best as I could. It's not like I was ever what you call close to my parents. My dad seemed distant at times, but I reckon you can attribute that to the fact that he grew up in a time where affection was a dirty thing. You know that time period where showing a bit of anchor would get you canned. Either way, money was something of a nebulous quality when you look for a place where you won't have to sleep on the road. Usually, people like to picture it as this chance to start a fresh new life. That by buying a house, it makes you seem like more of a man. Well, here I am, a dirty and desperate man who takes terrible care of himself. Locking out with someone wanting to offload a house he said he had been in his family for generations. Of course, the sell sounded way too good to be true. Some random shack was willing to sell this house to some half-jobless deadbeat. Needless to say, there was indeed a catch. Hence, my complaints about mortgages. My bank was always crap to me in the best of times, and now that I was saddled with this cheap shack, they were taking the worst of times and decided to dance on my unfilled grave. Apparently, I was going to have to take out two mortgages on this place, just to cover the costs of the repairs that were going to be needed. Absolutely wonderful, I know. However, I still really feel like I lucked out here. There's only so much time in this world, and... As much as I would like to spend it all complaining, there are better things for me to be doing. Like, for example, finally being able to rest my weary legs on the nice sofa chair combo that the previous owner had set up. It was pristine. Had some fine quilting covering the otherwise well-crafted leather. And most importantly of all, it was comfortable. 
The whole place, contrary to the repair cost, was actually in very good condition. Once you pulled away all the plastic covering on the floor and furniture, it looked like the picture of a modern house. It had all the expensive room, all the quality items, and it even had decent lighting that wouldn't blow a fuse every six hours. It did make me wonder why it had such an exorbitant repair cost attached to it. The only reasonable explanation that I could come across was that the real estate agents were screwing with things again, because apparently bubbles and economics are really cool. However, as I sat it up them creaky pretty white steps, taken in the marvel of the nice stained glass that was patterned into roses in the window, I saw why that I suddenly struck down by the almighty dollar. The entire second floor was decrepit, like on the level that you would have to wear a hazmat suit for fear that something was seriously wrong with the place. It didn't smell per se, Otherwise, I would have found out about it on the way to the door, despite the fact my sense of smell doesn't really exist. It just seemed especially desolate, with none of the nice flooring that I had seen below it. It was clear that something had been here before, though. You couldn't fake all the outlines of dust like that, nor could you really fake the nails that were still stuck into the floorboards. No matter how bent they got, they were always still there, and it only got me thinking that someone had done one heck of a hatchet job. Honestly, it reminded me a lot of the old attic that my parents' house had. That being the musty old types, the ones where the dust would get stuck in the back of your throat and wreak havoc on your lungs for the next couple of hours. Add on that one also being the type where there were only a few floorboards set across to walk over with the cladding of the attic sitting there like a hawk waiting for you to fall through it. And I could have sworn that place was a death trap. Honestly, this place wasn't much better. The dust was just as bad, getting stuck down my throat and on my tongue with every step I took and every deep breath I heaved. The floorboards, while mostly all together, sagged with every heavy step on them that I took. Never mind that I had to avoid the ones that still had masses of nails jammed into them, because someone clearly couldn't hire a handyman to save their life. The terrible plaster jobs on the wall had only heightened my awareness of the fact. As I went in deeper, making sure to keep my steps lighter because a sagging floor was not going to be the cause of a trip to the hospital, a certain stench began to hit my nostrils, and it was one that I couldn't put my finger on exactly. It was nothing like the stench of decayed wood, which was terrible beyond every real stretch of the imagination. As I said before, my sense of smell is also not really one that's all together. It borders on an almost complete lack of it, except for exceptionally strong smells. However, the closer and closer I got to the epicenter of it all, the more it began to take hold. It was sickly. I don't know how quite to explain it, but it took my nostrils for a spin for sure. Hooking its putrid fingers up there and making their nest, probably eliminating my ability to smell for good now. If I had to put a word to it, it just smelled like death. Pure and simple. But that played as secondary to what I saw now laying in front of me, hidden right at the back of this bog-scented trash heap. It was an ordinary cardboard box, unsealed and no markings that could possibly tip me off without touching it first. Beyond the place smelling like someone had let one rip a few too many times, there wasn't anything too overtly wrong with it, but the ominous nature of it just sitting there open sent my mind into overdrive. With caution I approached it, hand over my nose, head held high and ready to see the worst that this place had to offer. I didn't quite expect what I actually did find. Inside the box, and as pristine as the furniture below this abyss, was a set of cassette tapes. Alongside it was a sleek, polished, and silver tape recorder. It was not exactly what I was expecting to see, to say the least. Moving my head back down and devoting my full attention to the box, I detailed the full contents. 
There were four tapes in there, all labeled with numbers. At least someone was helpful to keep track of it. Had it been me, it would have taken a team of code breakers to figure out the correct order. Given how labeling simply was so tedious for me. Remarkably, there was not a single speck of dust on any of them. They all looked meticulously clean, like they were polished day to day. The more that I thought about it, the more it didn't really make any sense though. The box had been opened when I had arrived, and somehow these tapes were clean when everything was settled with layers upon layers of dust. Shaking the thoughts clear for a moment, I could always figure it out later since it wasn't like my time was precious, but curiosity began to overtake me. I hadn't seen one of these things since my dad. He was big into them for some reason, always preferring to go off to his man cave to record his stupid man things. I didn't think much of it to be honest. It seemed like a harmless enough hobby. Still, as I now pulled out the tape recorder, setting it on the one part of the floor that didn't sag, I couldn't help but let my curiosity keep growing. Fiddling with the first tape in my hand, I stared at the thing. The stench of the place was still omnipresent, but it had long taken a backseat to my new desire. What could possibly be on there? Looking back, I probably should have known to keep well enough alone. Fixing the cassette in place, having to fiddle with the edges to make sure the thing slid in properly, I took a small breath not wanting dust and stink to assault me before pressing play. Um, hello, hello? Testing, 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 one, two, three. Jesus, these things are so fiddly. Some sick guy is probably getting enjoyment in heck knowing that his invention is causing so much misery. And I hope he's enjoying as he burns forever. Anyway, that's not what these things are supposed to be about as much as I may like them to be. There's been something in my mind for a while, and um, I just need to let it off my chest before it gets a little bit too much for me. And people have been calling it inhumane and something that even the devil would be repulsed by. How could one man possibly be so evil to willingly take the skin and flesh off of a seven little brats? Uh, that's what they've all been parried into these heavens, crying out for someone to find the killer. Supposedly, they all imagine this killer to be some mad man. I would hate to tell them that. That ended back in the 80s. Still, they've been searching for the killer for eons by now. But they never found the one behind it all. It was me. More on that later. But dang, does it feel good to be able to finally say that. What the... What the heck... I had almost taken too many steps back after hearing that last declaration, nearly falling victim to that sagging floor that was just begging at this point to turn me into chow. The man's voice, it was clearly a man. There was no way a woman's voice was that deep with the tack used here. It was so serene in that declaration. I could feel the removal of all the weight on his shoulders like he was lifted by the declaration of what he had done to those kids. The logical part of me wanted to end it all there, wanted to drop the crap and leave. The scared part of me didn't know if living in this house with this up above me would be worth it, that these recordings were going to be gnawing away at my guilt for ages. The idiot part of me was the one that inserted the second tape and pressed play. Hey, I think I've finally gotten the hang of this thing now. It looks like that inventor of this horrible thing can't relish me anymore. What a crying shame. Regardless, I think it would be time to elaborate on what I said in my last recording. Now, what could a plain old respectable man like myself want with what I did to those kids? I have a respectable job, a loving family, and a steady stream of income that most men would kill for. Surely there is nothing terrible laying underneath. Nothing that would drive a man to do what I did. Wrong. Oh god, I'm trying to think about how to explain. You ever know that one kid that always makes horrible decisions? The one that takes without asking? Or the one that ends up breaking stuff you work so hard on and then lies about it? The one that you want to reprimand? However, because they're a kid, you can't really do anything to them without getting into some form of trouble. 
it's just so frustrating to put into a single word. Daniel was always like that. Every single time he would be making some asinine choice that would drive me up the proverbial wall. He would keep saying that what he had done was an accident. But I know better than to trust him on that because he's a liar. He was always such a terrible kid. And then he acted surprised when I said that I didn't love him. I mean, did I give him any indication that I did? Did I smack him upside the head too hard that he started hallucinating? What a little pest he was. No matter how many times I tried to get him to leave, whether it was him begging for forgiveness or trying to lie his way out of punishment, he would stick to me like a bad stench. I don't recall when I first felt the urge to... to want to do it to him. Maybe it was a month after the fact. Maybe a year. I don't know and it doesn't matter at this point. All I wanted and all I desired was to see the life draining from his eyes. I wanted to feel my hands around his neck. And I wanted to feel the desperation he would give in trying to cling to his terrible life. Unfortunately, if I did that then I would get caught. And Daniel would be allowed to corrupt people further and further until they all became insufferable brats. But fortunately I came to a solution. I remained silent, quietly shaken in the stench-ridden hack that I had trapped myself in. It is said that humans have two reactions when presented with danger, fight or flight. They didn't tell you that Freeze was the unwanted stepchild. I could barely form a thought as the image of what he had probably done to that kid started to enter my thoughts. He sounded so overjoyed half the time, and incredibly bored the rest of the time. There wasn't the slightest hint of remorse in those words and it didn't sound like he planned to add any later on. There were only two tapes remaining after all and these two were horrific enough that I couldn't imagine what was coming my way the next time. I had to fight back bile and vomit from the smell in the images as I pressed the third one in. Maybe, maybe, maybe it didn't have to be Daniel exactly. There's plenty of terrible people in this world that smile at you on the street as you pass them by. I'm sure their kids would grow up to be just as well. Plus, if they turn out just as terrible as Daniel then, that's just another arrow to my bow. They'll deserve it just as much as he does. Now the question of, how do I lure them to their fate? Well, kids are always trained to obey authority figures, aren't they? It's not like they would be able to tell a real badge from a fake one as well. And of course, I had to make sure they wouldn't make too much noise. Whether it was a knife or a bullet, it didn't matter so long as it was silent enough to not get caught. Therefore, I could take the brat, do whatever I wanted without making a sound, and then leave with no regrets at all. Uh, of course he had no regrets. What kind of person do you have to be to justify to yourself that there's something out there that makes this okay? Throughout my mind, I could only picture what those final few moments were for those kids. Having their lives ripped from them because some weirdo like this sounded so overjoyed with himself about it. Seriously, the way that he spat out, no regrets at all made me sick to my stomach. It was an awful reality though. He was clearly psychotic. If it wasn't obvious enough beforehand, but it only made me think about what he said earlier. His motive wasn't just to get rid of the kids, but to do it with ones that seemed like his own son. What the last tape set in before I even realized it, I pressed play for the last addition to this horrid tale. My finger, however, was hovering over the stop button for every waking second of it. I didn't want to imagine this monster going into detail. I tried to play father to these brats, but it didn't work. I don't know why I thought it would. Such snot-nosed brats were terrible to their own. Why would it be any different to me? Maybe I just wanted a second chance. Oh, my head hurts. Anyway, who cares if some kids are meeting their end? All they did was take these brats that no one would miss. Hardly a cause for any real alarm. Yet here I sat, 
watching the uproar with nothing but a muted knowledge that they would never figure me out. I had those bodies really good. I hid them so well, they're not even privy to the eyes of heaven. I was met with glorious chimes of silence. Never before had it allowed me into its sweet arms with the same amount of joy that I had showed it before. The stench almost didn't matter to me anymore. Until I finally decided to stand up, that was. It seemed like the position on my knees was helping me stave off the worst of it, because I was blasted with it the second that I got up. It was coming from every direction, off every single wall with no signs of stopping, and it only seemed like it had gotten worse due to the tapes. It wasn't until I started to lean myself against one of those walls that I started to realize just where this epicenter was. The crappy plaster job. That could have only been done by someone that was unaware of how this worked. And with how this guy operated and where he said he had the bodies. And then the cost for the repairs. Oh god. And then I heard something. And now that I've said everything I want to say about my work, there is one last thing that I would like to say. You might own my home now, but I assure you, I'm still here. I've marked this box and seen these tapes so many times in my life that I can tell the difference in placement to a microscopic level. So, you better put it back and you better start running. It wasn't just the final part of the tape recording. It was a moan and footsteps. I passed away for two minutes. Heaven isn't what everyone expected. Written by the Corgi Master. The last thing I remembered before waking up was a very painful feeling. I think that I was driving home on the highway from my boring office job. I decided to go home early because my boss was really getting on my nerves. I reached for my drink and the next thing I know, there was a loud crash and the middle of my car warped like it was nothing. The glass shattered into millions of pieces and the fabric was ripped apart. I felt a great pain as my vision blurred greatly. I barely managed to look out of my broken door of my warped car. I saw another vehicle with two people inside of it. I reached out before passing out completely. I vaguely heard the sound of yelling and sirens. I learned later that I was hit by a drunk driver who was on the wrong side of the road. The next thing I remember is waking up in a gray bed. I sat up in bed, covered in sweat as I looked around in a panic. The whole room seemed to be made of stone. It was all the same shade of gray as the bed with no shadows and one door on each wall. The bed was in the middle of the small room. I jumped out of bed and yelled for help before feeling an overwhelming amount of calm. I approached one of the doors and gave a small knock, but it did nothing so I knocked harder. Again, nothing. Nothing happened so I tried pushing the door open, but it still wouldn't budge after I kept hitting and pushing. I heard a door open behind me as I tried and a young, energetic voice spoke. My good friend, what you are trying won't work. I heard you knocking, however, the man said. I turned around and saw a tall man wearing a white button-up shirt and white dress pants. His long hair and beard were untamed and perfectly black. Where am I? What's going on? Who are you? I panicked, assaulting him with all my questions. Calm down, young one. I know it's all confusing, but stay calm. 
His voice instantly calmed and filled me with hope. All of your questions will be answered shortly. Just follow me. I did as the man said, following him as he pushed another door open. When the door opened, I heard what sounded like a melody. I couldn't really make it out, but it sounded like a storm with constant banging and crashing. It sounded like it was underneath them. Nevertheless, the door led to another gray room. This time it looked much nicer with no cracks. As well, it had a brown wooden chair and a velvet chair. He sat down in the wooden chair and pointed for me to sit down in the other. I'd been so excited to meet you. Nowadays, every person I meet is an excitement. I will answer some of your questions now. I ignored the storm underneath us and positioned myself in the chair. Where am I? I looked around the room as the man smiled softly. You are in the afterlife. You crossed over. I am Mr. Abe Salvador, but you can call me Abe. I believe you are Jacob Lawrence. Uh, nice to meet you, Abe. Why am I so calm? What are we doing? I didn't understand at all why I was so calm. After all, I had just found out that I wasn't living and now I'm talking to some dude in a gray chair. Uh, whatever. You feel calm because you are here right now in this room. Or rather, the group of rooms. As for what I'm doing, I've been waiting for a special person. And you just might be that person. He seemed super happy. And it seemed to make me happy as well. So, are you an angel or are you... I mean, you know, the man upstairs. I anticipated the answer to this question, but deep in my body, I felt terror and fear. Excellent question, young one. I am not an angel. I am the creator, God and all-powerful. I made everything you ever saw. I controlled everything from behind the scenes. Well, it's a funny thing. I control almost everything. He stopped talking, waiting for me to ask him further. Well, what do you not control? I stuttered as he waited for me to ask this exact question, as his smile never faded. In fact, it grew wider. You, my young one, I control the weather, the earth, the stars, but I can't control what you do. Neither on earth or here. Of course, I can stop you just as much as any human could on earth, but I can't make you do anything. I thought it was very interesting. However, his smile has grown to just plain unnerving. Now then, anything else? He asked. Nothing else I wanted to know came to mind. I didn't know what I had in store, but I had to be ready for it. Sure. He stands up as I do, and he led me to a wall. He put his hand on the wall, and he looked over before winking at me. The wall warped into a staircase made of gray and white marble. When I first arrived, I didn't realize some of my senses were missing before this. I heard the storm louder than before as well as the banging. It smelled heavily of dust and tears. I even tasted dust in the air. Um, Abe, where are we going? I said as I walked behind him. We are going to see your fate. What happens after you pass? He spoke with no hint of joy at all. Then we walked for a very long time before we reached the bottom of the stairs. But what I saw rocked me to my very core. We were standing on a balcony that saw the source of the noise. It wasn't a storm. I saw what looked like everybody who had ever lived. All of them cried out as they built a kingdom of silver and gold. 
but they no longer looked human. They had gray, leathery skin and wore nothing but black garments. Their eyes were missing as they cried out in pain from building an endless kingdom. I stammered for a second as Abe looked at it all. This is my kingdom, child. You have a choice to accept me. I know you will. If you do, you can become an angel and live with me. He turned and put a hand on my shoulder. He looked with anticipation. I whimpered. What is this? You're not our creator. You're a monster. I scrambled to get away as his face changed to one of absolute rage and disappointment. I tried running up the staircase, but the corridor closed as if there was nothing there. That's harsh, child. He grabbed my shoulders and looked me in the eyes. His eyes were dead and empty. His eyes were there, but there was no emotion. Why would you do this? How long have they been working for? I yelled at him. They build my kingdom forever. From when they pass to forever, it won't end. But I'm surprised. His voice calmed, but he was still clearly mad. I gave you a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to become an angel. Not very many people get that option. And you decline. You disrespect me. He began to yell again. He reminded me of an angry father. I felt the same way of when my dad found out that I broke a window on his work car. Man, that was a fun day. I jerked my shoulders and slipped out of his grip. I'm not sure what my idea was, but to be fair, what was I supposed to do? I punched him across the face. Of course, it didn't do anything except make him angrier. Really? I mean, really? Let's do this somewhere else. He whistled, seeming to call something. I heard screeching from the air. The angels will take you. Abe simply walked into the solid wall as three angels arrived. But they were the worst. These things weren't heavenly beings dressed in white with nice wings. They were completely white with leathered skin and wings that looked warped and gross. The legs were short and twisted while their arms were long and muscular. It looked like things were poking and jabbing under their skin and their joints had gray spikes stabbing out of them. All of them looked like hunchbacks as well. But their heads. They lacked any sense of being alive at all. All I saw in their eyes were a desire to hurt. They had many eyes in the front of their face with gaping jaws that revealed an empty black pit of a mouth. They had no nose and tree-like horns poking out from the top of their heads. One of them screeched at me, opening its mouth wider than I've ever seen any animal. I decided anything was better than these guys, so I jumped off the balcony, plummeting down. But they swooped down and grabbed me, all the while making noises that should have come from demons and not angels. And Abe just wanted me to become one of these things. He's insane. Their grip on me was very strong, and they flew me to one of the buildings deep into the city of gold. They reached a small gray building in the center of the very large town. They landed and two of them let me go and walked towards the building. It was made of granite with two rusted gates that took the other two angels to open it. It led to a stairway that they carried me down. It smelled of burning and rotten meat. Everything seemed to be silent except for these steps of the angels. After what felt like hours of going downstairs, we reached a small room with a wooden desk. Abe was there, sipping a drink. What the? He interrupted me. He didn't have manners, did he? Why do you think I made humans? He didn't look at me, Stain turned around, sipping his drink. What? I don't know. What are you going to do? He ignored my question. 
I need you to give me fuel. After you pass, you come here and I take your souls to give me the energy I used to make them. Unless you're an angel. He turned around and walked towards me. I give you a chance, but you threw it away. And now, I'm going to make you suffer for it. He smiled. Why would I want to help you? You're a monster. I yelled at him. He punched me in the gut, hurting me much more than I did to him. Since when was I not a monster? I cause storms. I destroy lives. I have even tampered in the human mind to make certain people certain ways. But I made you. He grabbed my face and gritted his teeth. You are nothing but play toys for me. I gave you a special chance. No one gets to be an angel, but I thought that you were different. I guess not, he whispered. He grabbed a knife from his desk. Wait, no, you can't do this. I'm sorry, I'll do anything. I begged him. I can do anything I want. He made a large cut on my cheek. As he spoke, a whole array of senses entered my mind as I faded away. It felt like I woke up, but I was in a hospital bed. They told me that I had been gone for two minutes, but they somehow had managed to save me. I still had that cut on my face, and I asked the doctors and nurses about it. They said that it wasn't caused by the crash, and they didn't know how it even got there. I know about what will happen after we all pass. Abe will be waiting for everyone when we come, and we will build his kingdom. I don't know much about it, but I know three things. If you have the chance to become an angel, accept it. Live life good, and don't take anything for granted. And I know heaven isn't what everyone expected. I'm a ranger at Wolf Lake National Park. There are monsters in these woods. Written by Lou Hemingway. It's been a while since I sat in front of this computer. I promised myself I would stop typing about him, stop thinking about him, stop giving him life. Sharing his story spreads his fear. It helps him grow. So that's why I haven't been updating you guys. But now, uh, things have changed. Things have gotten so much worse. I have to go now. On a mission I likely won't make it back from. But it's my only hope. If we fail, uh, no one is safe. If I don't make it, and the world begins to burn, then I want at least people to know what happened, and that we tried. Ten months ago, I visited a retreat in Alaska for 12 weeks. Officially, I was there to complete my mandatory park ranger general safety and rescue training, as stated in my employment contract. Unofficially, I was there to get myself away from Wolf Lake and Edward Dean Keller. In short, for those who haven't read my previous entries, Edward Keller was a piece of crap, and he hurt a lot of people, who even after his death, continued his reign of terror over this Colorado town. When he wasn't destroying families in their tents and snatching children into the woods, never to be seen again, then he was haunting my dreams, poisoning my mind with visions of his heinous things he had inflicted on the innocence of this world. One night, my gaffer Phil, Richard, and the Wolf Lake Sheriff bundled me into a car to get me out of town before that psychopath spirit could have his way with me, deep in the heart of Wolf Lake. 
Alaska was meant to clear my head, give me a cinch of normality so I could return to work with a free mind. Then I could follow the rules and keep Edward Keller at bay. The thing is though, it turns out Wolf Lake, Ed Keller, it's just one piece of a very dark and horrifying jigsaw. I learned through a clandestine group of rangers from other national parks that there are others out there. I heard stories that would make sleep impossible if I had not seen the stuff that I had already seen. It was clear to me now that the woods, wherever in the world, weren't safe. Something needed to be done. By the time that my plane landed in Denver, the snow had started to cover the highest peak of the Rocky Mountains, and the hardcore Christmas fiends had started to light up the town of Wolf Lake with light and tinsel. My cab made good time and within 40 minutes, I was pulling up that all too familiar dirt path and through the main gates of Wolf Lake National Park. It wasn't long after signing myself into the staff register in the visitor center that I was paying the driver and dragging my case through my cabin door. I stared at the room where I last saw Keller. My head began to pound and my temples started to burn. I closed my eyes in pain. I just want people to know that I'm back, James. It's no fun, you know, being stuck all by myself in these woods. No one to play with. No one to keep me entertained and satisfied. It's not good at all. His words flashed in my head and I nearly vomited from remembering that foul stench of rotting meat. It's why when you bring me some nice family, well, I get a little excited. I get a little carried away. <laughs> Keller's evil laugh rang in my ears as the vivid trauma from that night remained fresher in my mind than I could have ever imagined. Thankfully, Phil and I had taken up meditation on our 12 weeks away. We weren't converting to anything, but we decided that we needed to be able to clear our heads of darkness should we ever need to. It didn't always work, but it really depended on how bad the thoughts were. Thankfully, most of the time, I didn't let them get to the point of no return. Until now. As soon as the sun lit up the 395 square miles of woodland, I left my cabin, climbed on my now staff-issued ATV, and headed up to Phil's tower for a catch-up. He had been mysteriously called back to Wolf Lake around week 10 of our retreat, and was extremely sheepish about why he had to go alone. Smoke was coming out of the top of the tower when I had arrived. Not surprising, it was a cold morning, very cold. No snow on the ground as of yet, here in South Colorado, but it wasn't far away. I jogged up the stairs, half to reach the top quicker, and half to warm myself up. When I reached the bottom step of the final flight, I noticed the door was slightly ajar, and I also heard voices. I made sure to crouch so as to not be seen through the window. I got my ear as close to the crack of the door as I could. Richard, this can't go on. I don't know how many more cover-ups or sleepless nights I've got left in me. You have to pass it up the chain. We need a solution, whoever they are. They are growing in power. We're not safe anymore. It's only a matter of time. Phil's plea was filled with exhausted desperation. Oh, Phil, I assure you that I have, and that's why Mr. Black is here from the agency. And also, Dan has his department on high alert, looking for anything untoward. Richard replied, Untoward? Richard mocked the phrasing with a scoff. Mr. Tench, if I may. The unknown agent interjected, It's Phil. Phil, my name is Miles Black. I've been sent here to be the boots in the ground here at Wolf Lake. I can assure you that the agency is well aware of the hazards that are here, and at the other parks, and we are devising a plan to control it. I don't think you have any idea of what these hazards are, Mr. Black. You haven't seen the things that I have, Phil snapped. No, I haven't witnessed the entity that inhabits this particular park. Nor can I say I've witnessed the others at the other parks that we've spoken about. 
But what I can attest to is saying that I've witnessed a heck of a lot of my time at the agency. For you see, before we were reassigned, I was part of a unit known as Team X1. My ears perked up. I had read that name before. I tried quickly to recall where I'd heard it before it hit me. The Yellowstone Ranger who saw them hunting something, he heard them say it on the radio. If my interest wasn't piqued, it certainly was now. We were a specialized unit. Our typical objectives involved extremely close encounters with things that you don't exactly find on safari. We were deployed typically to track and study, but more often than not, we hunted these things. What sort of things? I heard Sheriff Ferrar inquire. Well, predators. These sorts of things that you only hear about in campfire stories, movies, and your worst nightmares. Most cultures call them cryptids. Hunted down a trio of trapdoor spiders, the size of freaking horses, and the Amazon back in 08. Tracked more Wendigos than I care to remember, and I've found countless skinwalker victims. Well, what's left of them anyway? So no, I don't have a great deal of information about what is going on at these specific locations. But please, Phil, don't assume that I'm clueless. This is why we are here. To find out what we are dealing with, the agent explained. Okay, but if you guys are so plugged into these cryptids, then why is it the first time that we're meeting you, huh? Phil probed. It was a fair question, I thought. Because as horrifying, violent, and malevolent as the things that I've seen are, they were physical beings. They walked on legs, they breathed our air, and they killed with their fangs and claws. The entities that occupy these black sites like Wolf Lake, Redwood, and Glaciers, the Appalachian, and Death Valley. Well, they aren't exactly physical. They can't be tracked, hunted, or killed. And not by anything mortal, anyway. So what? You brought some immortal weapon with you or something? Phil mocked. There is a silence. I looked through the crack in the door and caught a glimpse of Richard and this Miles Black sharing an awkward look. They seemed to be deciding on how to answer. Well, there's something in the works, Miles began. I was so enthralled, waiting for the rest of that sentence that I nearly crapped myself when my walkie-talkie crackled to life. I quickly scrambled, fumbling at my belt and turning off the radio before any more static came through. A few murmurs came from inside, before footsteps began to approach. The door swung open. Were you expecting anyone, Mr. Tench? Miles asked. No, I wasn't, Phil responded. I stood, frozen still, staring through the gap where the door hinged, as Miles, Richard, and Sheriff Ferrar looked around. At one point, I could have sworn Richard looked right at me. I desperately controlled my breathing. Look, we have a part to run, so maybe we should leave Phil to rally the rangers. Pick this up another time, Richard suggested. And I need to brief my guys that are missing person. Try to track these guys down, Farrar added. Okay, I need to make a few calls to HQ. But then Richard and I am going to need a couple of your guys to give me a tour of the park. Show me significant locations. I can do that. Me and my colleague James. I'll go get him from his cabin and we can meet you at the VC in around an hour. Phil suggested. Sounds good. Miles confirmed. Richard the sheriff and this Miles said their goodbyes and made their way down the stairs. As Phil waved them off from the balcony. I planned to let Phil go back inside, wait a few more minutes before knocking on the door. But as Phil made his way back into the cabin, Jesus Christ, get your butt in here, James, before you freeze those big ears of yours off. I couldn't help but chuckle. So, how you been? Phil asked, as he stirred the coffees that he had prepared for us. Irish, no doubt. Good, yeah, I've been good, Phil. But come on, let's not stand on ceremony. 
We need to talk about what just happened. Oh, you mean you eavesdropping on a private conversation? Phil act fictitiously. I chuckled away the criticism. How did you know I was there anyway? I asked curiously. You kidding? Besides, you have a penchant for listening in on conversations that don't involve you. I saw you peeking through the door crack right before you leaned on the walkie. Not exactly James Bond, kid. Phil said, teasing me. I'll try to be more subtle next time. I replied with humor. No, we need to talk about the conversation that you just had. And the dozen conversations I had in Alaska with a number of the rangers. Phil looked at me confused. You better sit down, I invited. And he complied. He didn't say a thing, other than taking a large gulp of his beverage and allowed me to open up. So, all of those late night walks where you were clearing your head, you were having secret liaisons with a group of government whistleblowers. Phil's tone was no longer teasing, it was annoyed. Well, technically, they never blew the whistle, so... I don't care, Phil snapped, slamming his fist down on the coffee table. I was honestly startled. I didn't recognize the man that sat across from me right now. Jesus, Phil, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lie. It's just they wanted no one to know. I explained to Phil as he held his face in his own hands. He sat upright once again and composed himself. No, kid, I'm sorry. It's just been a little intense here, Phil confessed. Intense? Phil, what's going on? Is this why you had to come back early? Yes, he said with a heavy heart. Mark, he's missing. Atwood? Yeah. Richard says he started acting weird around four weeks after we left. Late for work, looking like he hadn't slept in days. No one could get him on the radio after hours. And then around two weeks ago, they found his cabin door wide open. His bed sheets thrown around the room. Blood and fingernail scratch marks leading out the door and into the woods. As soon as the trail got around five meters into the forest, it stopped dead. No more sign of Mark. So, with him gone, I became head ranger, Phil explained. I didn't tell you because you seemed to be doing good. I didn't want to, you know, trigger anything, he added. I gently nodded. Fair enough. I thought to myself. So, uh, does anybody know what happened? Uh, to Atwood, I mean. I assume that's who Sheriff Ferrar was talking about. Come on, kid. What happened was the same thing that would have happened to you if we hadn't turned up at your cabin that night. Phil sat with sorrow. I hung my head in sad acknowledgement. But no, that's not who Ferrar was referring to. Phil's revelation snapped me upright in my seat. Then who? I asked. Alex Jessup, Phil revealed. It honestly took a few seconds before I realized the significance of that name. And when it hit me, boy did my body go limp. The kid who? Got Keller arrested, yeah. Not a kid anymore though, he's about 24. Phil informed, finishing my sentence for me. Well, what, uh, what happened? What are the police now? I inquired. Phil scoffed and began shaking his head, knowing the darkness of his next sentence. They found his apartment broken into. The phone line had been cut too. Drag marks on the carpet leading from his bed, out into the hallway and down the stairs to the front door. Smashed ornaments, it looks like the kid put up a fight. I'll give him that. There was a symbol painted on the mirror in his bedroom. That same symbol we found by Keller's tree that fateful night 17 years ago. The cult of Kettle Moraine, I thought out loud. Phil hummed in agreement. Why though? And do you think that it's linked to Atwood? I began to fire questions at Phil in a curious tangent. I have no idea. Part of me, in all honesty, doesn't want to, kid. But they went missing within the space of nine days of each other. This is the first ten of these people we've had in Wolf Lake since that night. 
I have no idea what they've been up to since, but whatever it is, it can't be good. Later that day, Phil and I took Miles Block on a tour of the park, showing him key locations when it came to Ed Keller, the Keller tree, the various holes where we found the children's clothing, the location of the Wendy Cartwright sighting, not to mention the far too many locations upon where I've had to cut down a butchered and mangled up couples from trees, praying that their insides don't splatter on me upon the impact when they hit the ground. He took notes, measurements, photos of everything, logging them all on some high-tech government-issued tablet. And trust him, not yet anyway. I didn't know enough about him to say it if I did, quite frankly. The feeling was mutual, however. His face was less than calm when Phil began talking openly about Ed Keller in front of me. This soon went away, however, when we filled him in on the past five months. If anything... I think he saw me as useful now. Okay, gentlemen. I think I have everything that I need. Apart from one thing, Miles said. What can we do for you? Phil asked, curious. You, James, he said, pointing the tablet at me. Me? Yes. Given how the thing that we are dealing with seems to attack initially in the dreams of its victims... We are at a disadvantage when it comes to scouting it. But you, on the other hand, you have seen it. You have information that is critical to this operation being a success. Miles informed us, almost sounding like a salesman pitching a potential customer. Oh, whatever I can do to help, I offered. I would like to sit down with you tonight in your cabin, just me and you. I want to ask you some questions and go through some tasks under certain conditions. Would that be okay? The emphasis that he placed on the word conditions made me wary. But what else could I say? 6 p.m. okay, he suggested. I better make it 8. Miles didn't bother to ask why. By the time that Miles Black turned up at my cabin... The sun had already set and a blanket of dark velvet had set across the forest known to the locals as the Lake of the Wolf. Come on in, I invited. Miles nodded and made his way into my cabin. He hadn't arrived empty-handed. A large metallic briefcase hung from his right hand. I found myself staring at it, imagining the potential contents. Take a seat, please, Mr. Parker. Miles ushered me onto a chair at my kitchen table. Anyone would think I was a guest in this home, not the other way around. Miles or Mr. Black was a weathered man. He had either had a very hard 40s or an easy 55. His strong, cold, military appearance made me think twice of asking him to clarify his age. So, what's in the briefcase? I asked nervously. My question was completely ignored, which didn't aid my anxiety. I need you to tell me everything you can about the person or entity known as Edward Dean Keller. Miles' question was extremely formal and I assumed he was recording me. And I was right, he'd put his cell phone on the table, which had already been recording for the past 47 seconds. Anything at all, Miles added prompting me to quit pondering him and answer his question. Okay, I said, steadying myself. Miles eyed me intently, eagerly awaiting my information. Around six months ago, I packed up what life I had to move from Atlanta to Wolf Lake in order to take this job. When I had arrived, I found newspapers in my cabin that were left over from a previous occupant. I started reading them. I saw an article about a boy who had vanished in these woods in 04. His name was Danny. Before his disappearance, he said that he saw a man. A man in the woods. Adults tried to find him, but there was no sign of anyone. The next day, the kid goes missing. A woman named Wendy Cartwright said that she saw a thing in the woods, around 20 miles from the last place the kid was seen. This thing, it was carrying a child said it was skipping or tiptoeing or something like that, said that it looked inhuman whatever it was. 
I looked into the disappearances further and I soon discovered that there were over 20 cases like this in Wolf Lake. Kids missing, families slaughtered, just awful stuff. At the time, there was another case like these going on. A family had gone missing, and we found the adults quickly. They were in pretty rough shape, hanging on tree branches next to each other with their skin missing. The kids, well, little Riley and Ashley, we never found them. Just their undergarments. It was buried about half a meter underground. That night, I was on watching TV, and the sad had just switched the channel to a news report of the missing kids. The remote was at the other side of the room at the time. The reporter makes a reference to a guy called Ed Keller, a psychopathic killer. It was like something was wanting me to know about him, and I can't really explain it. Anyway, I started to look into him deep. I began to see patterns and similarities between the crimes of Keller and the disappearances and the deaths here at Wolf Lake. I see. Please, Mr. Parker, please continue. Miles encouraged. The recording finished at 1 hour and 46 minutes by the time that I had filled Miles in and my dreams about Ed Keller and the resulting horror, such as what had happened to Chuck and his kids. In the interest of protecting the men from Alaska, I didn't mention the things that I had learned from my time there. I instead tried to get it from the horse's mouth. As soon as I've answered your questions, would you answer one of mine? Miles smirked and gently chuckled. It depends what it is. I smirked back. Come on, man. I've seen things that you haven't. I'm the only one at this park who has seen him and lived to tell the tale on tape. I think you can trust me with what I want to know. Miles nodded. Touche. I'll make a deal. You agree to play ball with what I have in this briefcase and I'll tell you anything you want to know. What do you say? I stared at the briefcase once again, wary of what could be inside. But not for the first time, my curiosity got the better of me. Okay, who are you? Why have they sent you to deal with, well, whatever this thing is? Miles sighed, contemplating his response, blissfully unaware that I already knew the answer. I'm from a branch of the U.S. government that you might say is like a parent group of the outfit that you know is hazard control. We don't really have a name, we are just referred to as the agency. We along with hazard control are responsible for maintaining order of the things that roam the earth that aren't exactly regular. Like aliens, I probed. Aliens, monsters, mutants, cryptids. Anything unworldly that poses a malignant threat to the human race. I was the leader of an elite group of soldiers who would embark on missions to help contain these threats. Team 1X. The best of the best. He said with pride. So, where are the rest of you then? Why just send you? The rest of my team are out on other assignments. They are visiting other national parks where we've had reports of other issues. Other issues, I asked, trying not to let on that I already knew. People disappearing, lots of people. To the public, every disappearance is mysterious, but we know, you know. We know that it was a skinwalker in Yellowstone, the Wendigo in the Badlands, or even the 20-foot alligator that lurks in the Everglades. But the people who disappear at the black sites, we have no idea. We've heard some pretty disturbing reports from other rangers who, for the greater good, were silenced with money by hazard control upon instructions from the agency. Why is keeping the public in the dark about the danger part of the greater good? I asked with an edge of my tone. Miles, a hard man and clearly desensitized by making the hard call on a daily basis, looked slightly annoyed at my brash question. No, oh, because it's not that simple. They aren't normal predators. We can't just cut off their food supply and wait for them to starve. We tried that once. The rangers began to drop like flies. The ones who didn't, they left their pose. Before we knew it, their families, their friends, they all turned up dead. And the rangers went missing too. Jesus. 
What happened? I mean, God, that's messed up. Death Valley 03. I'll never forget it. The amount of crap we had to cover up. We had to make it look like these men had gone mad from too much time in the woods. Killed the people they lived with and gone on the run. Naturally to a few people, it seemed a little far-fetched. A few journalists, a couple of PIs, you know. Most of them went away with the right amount of money, but unfortunately, a few needed a bit more of an aggressive approach. I chose not to ask him to elaborate on that, instead choosing to let him continue without interruption. Anyway, we eventually got it contained, hired some new rangers for that area and began paying them hazard pay. We made them sign NDAs as a part of the new policy for all national park rangers. Hey, we couldn't risk letting the rangers know what they were dealing with. So, that's when we formed Hazard Control Division and implemented an agent in each of the national parks. Most of them just sit around, looking all official, but we need an agent in every park in case another one of these things decides to pop up. The point is, kid, we need to make sure we keep these things contained where they are. Any incidents, they need to be sugar-coated for the public to digest without pandemonium spreading. Yeah, a few innocents will die, but the greater good is these things don't grow in power and kill a hundred or a thousand more. I mean, look what happened when you simply sparked a conversation about Ed Keller in an internet cafe. It took no more than 20 minutes for this guy to throw that back in my face, but ultimately, I saw his point. I nodded my head in shamed agreement. Okay, so here's my last question, I said. Casey and Miles to set up an inch. Talking about the horrible things that these things and also his agency had done in 03 had caused him to slouch a little. Go on. If these things have been around since the late 90s, what's different today? What makes you think you can get rid of them now? Miles stared at me for a brief moment before he turned to the briefcase. He inserted a passcode into the keypad in the front of the case. A small beep was heard and the locks popped off. He only lifted the lid a few inches so I couldn't see the entire contents of it. He reached in and pulled out a thin blue binder. He placed it on the table and opened it up. A profile along with a photo of a man stared back at me. He was a scary looking individual. Beard down to his chest, thick black locks covering his face and broad shoulders. His stats said that he was 38, stood at 6'3 and weighed over 250. Not someone you want to owe money to anyway. This is Yubel, a real piece of work. Once part of the cult of Kettle Moraine, except in 02 he was excommunicated for being too extreme. Imagine that, huh? A group of delusional nuts who kidnap young teens and butcher them in the name of some mythical goat. And this guy is too much. It boggles my mind, Miles said, almost lost for words. Wait, delusional nuts. These Kettle Moraine guys created these entities, right? They gave Ed Keller his life back, didn't they? I was a little lost. No, not exactly. You see, Yubel was a lot of things. Sociopathic, infatuated with power, but most importantly, he was influential. As Miles told the story, I continued to examine the file. Despite his youth, when they threw him out, a handful of the other younger and newer members were already taken in by his speak of, making the world a bow at his feet. They followed him out of the cult. With Yubo as the leader, they formed a new group. One that was willing to do what the Kettle Moraine just fantasized about. The black-robed people they were to be commonly known by. As I turned the page, there were four more profile pictures. Older-looking men, aged roughly in their 50s. Something I picked up on it, though, brought my attention back to Miles. Sorry, you said was a lot of things. Is he dead? I inquired. Miles grinned slightly, it took a second to nod at very, he said bluntly. I scanned on the page quickly, finding a clause at the bottom that read, Cause of death, murdered by subject 16A. Who or what is 16A? I asked, hearing of this before. 
something our agency uses to even the odds. His coy response wasn't lost on me and he quickly moved on for the topic. These other men were the original founding fathers of the cult of Kettle Moraine. These men were all murdered. His samples of each of these men's blood were found at what looked like remains of a ritual site, all of which took place at the black sites that I mentioned earlier. He let it sink in. We think the black robed people were responsible. We think, well, we're pretty certain actually. These guys not only killed the competition, but used them to birth these entities. Miles had no better words for them. But why? What's their game? We think that they're practicing, honing their witchcraft skills. Practicing for what, Keller? I asked. I don't think so. The first incident at Wolf Lake was in 04 and the bodies in Death Valley piled up in 03. The first incident reported in Redwood wasn't until 2012. No, they were honing their craft for a bigger play, a much bigger play. Miles' coy tone was back. What bigger play? I didn't let this one slide. All in good time, James, all in good time. Now it's time for you to keep up your end of the bargain. Miles began to place the file back in the suitcase, and as he did, something caught my eye. The bottom of the page is sticking out from under that last profile. The profile had an image at the bottom. I could only see the bottom left corner of the image, but what I saw, it made my eyes bulge. The papers were snatched away and placed where I couldn't examine further, but I could swear that it was a foot. A huge, dark blue foot with sharp black talons for toenails. I was so mesmerized. I didn't even notice the vial of clear liquid and the large syringe that Miles pulled out of the suitcase. Whoa, what the heck is that? I demanded to know. This is what you agreed to do if I answered your questions. Miles countered. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask what you're putting in my arm. I won't lie, James, it's not exactly FDA approved. It's something our boys in our laboratory whipped up purposely for this. A metabolite mixture of LSD and DMT combined with a sedative. By all accounts, this will induce a lucid dream. Then maybe we can see what we're dealing with here. Miles said, pulling out a laptop and an EpiPen. No, please no. It's taken me months to get back to a place where I'm not scared to close my eyes. Please don't make me go back in there. Please don't make me see him. I begged. Miles checked his watch. 10.20 p.m. Almost time to begin. He said, speaking to himself. Uh, Mr. Black, Miles, please. But my please fell on deaf ears. He opened up the laptop and double-clicked a PowerPoint icon labeled EK Inducement Exercise. No, oh, James, I know how scary it is to face evil, but I do what I do because if I didn't, everyone on this planet would suffer. And this right here is no different. Gathered clearly as a thing for you. You go to ground for 12 weeks and he lashes out at Mr. Atwood. The head ranger, just like that thing did in Death Valley in 03. If we don't face this thing now, find out how to beat it. Then it won't be long before the town of Wolf Lake and likely many, many others begin to suffer. He made a strong case. Oh, what if I get into trouble? Well, that's what this is for. Miles said, holding with a pen filled with two whole milligrams of adrenaline. One hit of that could probably wake up Walt Disney on a warm day. Miles said with a smirk. You ready? He said, turning the laptop screen towards me. I was so nervous that I could barely speak, so I nodded. He tapped the space bar and an old film-style countdown initiated. As the timer reached one and the presentation begun, Miles began strapping up my bicep and waiting for a viable vein to appear. I wasn't the best with needles, so I remained fixated on the laptop. The first image was Ed Keller's mugshot. The second, a crime scene photo of Keller and Wait Meads. And the chamber of horrors within. Blood and sweat stained mattresses. Children dripping from the machines. Nineteen pairs of kids' clothing stuffed under the floor. I stared in horror. It was all coming back. The Robertson kids. Chuck and his wife hanging from the tree. Danny Waldron being dragged off. 
the smell of Keller's breath on the back of my neck, the innocent children being picked out of his teeth right in front of me. Whatever was in that syringe was now in my bloodstream, and I slowly began to lose sight of the images in front of me. I faded to black. A whirlwind of colors and images swirled around my mind, like paint in a washing machine. I felt like I was in the fastest elevator on the planet, taking me to the highest room in the tallest building. I felt sick. I closed my eyes, trying not to vomit. A few minutes passed, but eventually everything settled down. When it all calmed, I decided to open my eyes. I was in the middle of the woods, and I could smell burning, burning flesh. I gathered all the courage that I could muster and began making my way towards it. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. Wherever you may be in the world, I hope that you stay safe and sound. And as always, stay creepy.